Conservative. Constitutional. It's the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. Keeping you informed on what's going on right here in Kentucky. Today on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, it's primary season, which means the lies and the hits will keep coming and we're going to attempt to wade through it all over the next month right here on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. That's why you need to keep staying tuned in every single day leading up to these elections and past that so you can stay informed because on today's show, we'll go over what is at best a misleading and at worst an outright lying mailer coming out in the House District 45 race, which points to everything I've been telling you since I started doing this daily show about eight months ago, and that is that we have got to pay attention and parse out meaningless actions and votes that are used to twist and use for taglines while at the same time accomplish nothing and allows a person to vote no on the things that accomplish things and then vote yes on things that accomplish nothing, but it does muddy the waters. That's something we've talked about a fair amount on the show. And if we have time, an Airbnb stay in Lexington, Kentucky has gotten viral. I'll go over why and how we need to settle it down with our outlandish claims. So hopefully we'll get to cover that and we'll have all that and more today on the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. As always, if you want to check out past shows or reach out, head on over to theandrewshow.com. Once again, that's theandrewshow.com. And you can hit the Listen Now tab to see where you can listen to The Andrew Cooperwriter Show and check out old shows and hit the Contact tab for the contact form if you want to reach out to the show with your question, comments, or concerns. I may even read what you sent out over the air. Now, uh, I do have an ask, and I haven't asked this in a while, but if you want to support the show, if you like listening and you want to do a small thing in return for all the hard work uh, we do over here on the show, please share this with others. Maybe make a post on social media, text or call somebody asking them to listen. Maybe the next time you find yourself in a political discussion, mention, hey, you should check out the Andrew Cooper Writer Show and encourage them to tune in. Now, there is a downside to doing that because obviously I know all of you like to sound like the most informed person in your friend group. And if they start listening to the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, well, they'll know where you're getting it all from. But I'd still appreciate it if you reminded them to tune in. So the primaries are heating up in Kentucky. And I personally think that the 2024 primaries, if you're a conservative, if you're a Liberty Constitutional Republican, if that describes you, this might be the most important primaries we will ever have in any recent history or into the future here in Kentucky at the state level. The Republican repercussions for what happens in a month or so could be felt for the next decades, and I'll tell you why I think this to be true. So let's look at the battlefield as we have before us right now. And as I covered yesterday about establishment versus non-establishment, liberal Republicans, what that means. Well, you've got the liberal Republicans squaring off against the conservative ones, the conservative ones who want a transparent government that works for the people. That means prioritizing things like shrinking the size of government, prioritizing eliminating government waste, eliminating government departments and the things that government does. And meanwhile, you have the liberal Republicans who believe in spending more and increasing government services so government can grow in both its intrusiveness as well as its taxation levels. See, liberal Republicans believe that government can be a really good thing if it's in the right hands and it can actually solve everybody's problems if it's just that the liberal Republicans are in control and everyone would just leave it to them and the experts. Now you may ask, well, how does that make liberal Republicans actually different than the Democrats? And, and that's a, a good question. Um, but in practice, not too much other than uh, the social issues they won't openly talk about things on the social issues, but what makes them different from the Democrats is they're not going to actively as much push on them either, but they won't stop the, the liberal Republicans, as you're asking what's the difference between them and Democrat. Uh, they won't push liberal social things, but they're not going to 
stop setting up the infrastructure, the government apparatuses that these Democrats and leftists will use to take your money and fund their social wars. Now, if, if, if they're a liberal Republican and voters put enough pressure on them, uh, they may do something. It just it takes a ridiculous amount of pressure and most of the time to get them to do conservative things, conservative social things, especially it's very hard. You might get half measures. And so it becomes a, a real problem. But when it comes to actually rolling back what we have here, a, a never ending growing government, a growing in government services and spending and, and when it comes to actually wanting to destroy the processes, systems, departments that have become corrupt and infested, well, they will never do it because they need to solve our problems or think they uh, need to in order to have a reason for them to have power and get money from their investors. Sometimes they'll call them the donors. They need to solve our problems. It has to happen because if they're not solving our problems, well, what do we need them for and why would we count them as special and why would anybody continue to give them more powers? So the conservative Republicans, though, actually want concrete action. They recognize how far off track things are and say, hey, we can't improve this. We need to stop uh, uh, stop doing these things. We got to rethink what we're doing here. And so the, the liberal side of Republicans largely have the power right now in Kentucky. And that leaves people to ask why. Well, because they have right now all the money and generally speaking, a lot of the media attention. And they got it by making government once again work for their investors, not their donors. They may call them that. But as I said, these are people that give money to these lawmakers, give money to legislators. And in return, they expect an investment. Things like the horse parks and the hospitals and the gaming mafias and uh, the teachers unions and you know the list goes on and on of these special interests and they are making money by taking it out of your pocket and putting it into theirs creating these government monopolies creating a, a not a very free market as enforced by our Kentucky legislature and so right now these liberal republicans have the money they have the power they have the control because they're getting it from their investors but this group that has power isn't particularly inspiring. They themselves can't easily win elections. They have to co-op other people. That's why it took Trump running in 2016 to finally switch these Republicans over to having control of the House. And these liberal Republicans just happened to be there when it flipped and they got to bring in the cash and they used that to go ahead and grab control. But the con fraction of the conservative Republicans is growing. And before, it wasn't super clear who was who before 2016, 2017, technically that session, because everybody was just fighting the Democrats. And whether you're a liberal Republican who is just really more of a Republican, kind of like the same way people are sports fans, they just want to see, quote unquote, their guy, their team win. They don't actually have principles. And then the conservative Republicans who do have principles and actually want to see policy and changes be the thing that wins and, and be the net result. Well, those people were together until they grabbed power. And those were the elections in 2016. And then those people who are currently there were there. And then that leads to 2018. And they were taking over from the Democrats. So there's a lot that they could do that would seem conservative because now they're getting control and the power. And honestly, Bevin was kind of steering the ship there and love him or hate him. He at least recognized that changes needed to be made and, and was willing to kind of push against the establishment. But then 2020 happened that kind of broke the world and a whole lot more people, probably including yourself, started to pay attention to your state politics. And with Trump in office, the, the, leftist craziness accelerated what they were doing on the social issues. And we also saw Bashir acting on COVID issues. And we saw the Republicans in Kentucky in the Kentucky house fail in many, many ways to deliver. Just how did they fail to deliver? And how's this setting up the elections in 2022 that sets up for 2024 to be probably the most important primaries for the state of Kentucky for several decades that really can start to paint the picture. We'll have that after this short break. You'll listen to the Andrew Cooper Writer show, your source for Kentucky politics. 
And you're back with the Andrew Cooperator. So before the break, we are going into why 2024 primaries are going to be so important. And I'm laying out the battlefield for you. And so I kind of went into how these Republicans in the House kind of got control with the flip over. And, and now we're coming into 2020. COVID happens and they just kind of fold their cards. 2021 and 2022 come into play. People are paying more attention. And what do they see the Republicans do? They see them fail to act against Bashir on a lot of these COVID craziness. For an example, you see them fail to end the COVID emergency as soon as they could have. You see them make the, co the, the Ford deal during that kind of COVID era where they gave half a billion dollars to Ford. You see Bashir running rampant. You see that they failed to impeach Bashir. In fact, you see that they enabled hospitals in their special session in 2021. They enabled hospitals and funded them to be able to continue vaccine mandates. And they didn't fight any kind of vaccine mandate or masking at all. Certainly not as quick as they could. And as a result of that, every single open seat pretty much went for the conservative Republican choice over the liberal Republican choice in 2022 and in 2022, three liberal, liberal Republican incumbents, Sal Santoro, Ed Massey, and Adam Koenig were taken out. They lost in the primaries, big upsets in those primaries. And this caused some heads to perk up and start to worry on the liberal Republican side. Why? Well, because their control, the liberal Republicans, the establishment Republicans, their control is based upon money and them being able to buy votes with their ads and little cards. But if suddenly ads and little cards aren't cutting it anymore because in an average house race, it's only about 3,000 people voting. And if the people are getting out the word and saying, no, 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 don't vote for this person. He's awful. Well, then there isn't enough money that they can get a hold of in order to buy and keep power. And remember, the vast majority of politicians, as in 75% of them, are basically idiots. They're just happy to be there. I'm just being honest. They aren't particularly intelligent and they don't know much about politics. They're just happy to be clapped for and to have the honorific title. The other 25%, though, are the ones that are running the show. And for the 75%, it's all about the incentive structure of how do I stay in office? And if I stay in office by getting the money... And by listening to the liberal establishment Republicans, I'll vote how they want me to. But if actually the liberty conservative Republicans are a bigger threat to me because they are the base, they are the voters, and they actually are more of a threat to taking me out, well, maybe it's more effortless and easier for me to just stay in office if I vote the way that they want me to. And that's a really, really long saying way that I'm trying to explain what this election is exactly about. It really is about what incentive structure will run our Kentucky State House going forward. Who should that 75% listen to? And if the liberal Republicans can't squash the conservative Republicans now, it'll be even harder for them in the future or even Worse, if they can't squash them now and take out a few of the conservative Republican incumbents and the liberal Republicans, the establishment Republicans actually lose seats and every conservative incumbent stays safe. Well, 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 that's a huge shift in the incentive structure for that 75%. And if the establishment spends millions trying to take down the incumbent conservatives and protect the liberal Republicans and they don't succeed and the conservatives hold them off and even win, well, it's not just that the conservatives will have gained maybe three or four more votes by bumping off establishment uh, incumbents, but they may be able to get some of the wafflers in that 75% I'll call them, people that would feel safer voting the way we would want them to a conservative way if they saw that it was actually hard to take them out if if the establishment is actually it's harder for them to take them out than they thought and that the conservative republicans are able to galvanize the grassroots and hold on a lot better than they thought they could well the incentive structure switches where maybe a few more of those 
do start to vote the right way. So it's not just we may pick up two or three seats in the House, but by protecting our incumbents, the conservative Republicans, and picking up a few seats for the conservative Republicans by bumping off a few of the uh, uh, liberal incumbents, well, by swaying other House members, we may actually end up picking up more like five to eight votes to start voting in the more conservative way once they see what the incentive structures have become. And if they see that the chamber, the hospitals, the teachers unions, the gambling mafias, the corrupt parasites that suck on government, that spent millions, they spent millions trying to take down and protect their people, and they weren't able to do that. Well, so clearly now the conservatives have more sway, and these people start to vote more their way. The other thing this does is it weakens the leadership now, weakens the establishment in place, because how do you convince people to keep dumping millions into a losing idea? I mean, there's a reason why the Democrats at the state level in Kentucky really can't pull in a lot of money. And once Bashir's gone and a Republican takes over as governor, which will most likely happen here in two or so years, three or so years, well, Democrats will have a really hard time fundraising in Kentucky. Why? Because they have no power and they have no conceivable way that they're going to maintain power. And so if the establishment leadership liberal Republicans can't protect their people, they get bumped off, people start voting the other way, well, how do they convince their investors to keep throwing more good money after bad? Do, do those investors try instead to work with the conservative Republicans in an attempt to try and limit the damage that they'll do to you? Do you abandon spinning in Kentucky altogether? Are we able to rid the state of these political mafias? That will be the question, and that's why these primaries are so important, and that the people... They're targeting representatives like Doan, Masseroni, Proctor, Maddox, Rayburn, Callaway, and others if they can hold on to their seats and meanwhile liberal incumbents lose, well, how much more money will the establishment will leadership be able to bring in? How will they hold on to power? And we know how important this race is because we're seeing the liberal Republican establishment incumbents pulling out all the stops that they can playing dirty, dirty tricks. And in some cases, outright lying. That's right. just outright lying. And around the sides of untruthiness, we have a case involving a mailer coming out of the Killian Timoney camp, representative Killian Timoney, the incumbent in the 45th district being challenged by Thomas Jefferson that's the Fayette Judgment County area. And it appears that the Killian Timoney is sending out this mailer that is at best misrepresenting the truth. And by K- Killian's own admittance, at best, he's just misrepresenting what he's saying. But at worst, he's just outright lying. And it's always interesting to see how people like Killing Timney and others will lie in their mailers, the liberal Republicans, the establishment Republicans, how they lie. And this is how I know I'm on the right side. This is how I know I'm on the side of the people. This is how I know I'm right. The people I support don't pretend to have some sort of stellar voting and political record that the other side has. They don't pretend they have a stellar voting and political record. They don't need to pretend, but more importantly, they don't pretend to vote the way the other side does. But the liberal Republicans, the establishment Republicans will message and pretend to be what my side is. They will message on the same things I talk to you about, but they don't actually do that. But they'll message on it. They'll pretend. You see, even even in take uh, an open seat uh, up in northern Kentucky, we have Ed Massey, former incumbent, running against political newcomer uh, T.J. Roberts up in northern Kentucky. And Ed Massey sent out a mailer claiming he's the biggest Trumper there is. Him and Trump, because he knows Trump polls well. However, Ed Massey up in northern Kentucky donated to Hillary Clinton, never once did he actively support Trump, but he actually donated to Hillary Clinton in his past. 
But yet somehow, despite that, he somehow is still sending out mailers claiming to be super Trumpian. He knows he's not. He knows he hates Trump. But he's fine. Whatever he has to say to win, he's okay with it. But that's how we know we're on the right side. That's how we know we're representing the will of the people. Because we don't have to lie. We don't have to lie. So what did Killian Timney send out on his mailer? What did, what did Timney put out there? How did he pretend to be a strong conservative? Well, we'll be covering that after this short break. I'm coming up on a break here, but I do want to remind you, make sure you're sharing the show with others. You can head on over to theandrewshow.com. Once again, I know I told you at the top, but you can hit the Listen Now tab there, see all the places to listen. And on top of that, you can hit the Contact tab, reach out to the show with your thoughts, your feelings. I may read them out on the air. But I appreciate it if you shared this with others and told them, hey, come on over and check out the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. And as always, you can catch it at 1 p.m. on all the podcasting platforms. But if you want to listen to it before that, you can listen to it on WZXI at 9 a.m. and a replay at 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. And that is 94.1 FM, 95.5 FM and 1280 AM in the central Kentucky, uh, down into Garrett, Madison County area. That's where you can pick that up at, but we'll be going over exactly what Killian Timney sent out and how it's at best a mistruth. And at worst, he's just outright lying. We'll have that after this short break. We'll see you back here in a few, few minutes. And you're back with the Andrew Kubrider show. So Killian Timney, House District 45, sent out an interesting mailer uh, that he's definitely stretching it a bit, if not just lying. But what did it actually say? Well, we have that here for you. So uh, it says Republican. It's in green, and it's got like a bunch of Lucky Clover stuff on it, which, you know, Killian Timney, I guess, is Irish. Maybe that's what he's hitting at. I don't. I don't know why he thinks that's such a good reason to like, I don't know why he keeps hitting on that. Like he'll say that too, like all the time, like I'm Irish. I I don't particularly, I mean, I don't think Irish people are bad. I'm not going to like, I'm not voting for that guy. He's Irish, but I'm not going to vote for you because you're Irish either. It's really weird. Anyways, he said, Republican Killian Timney, conservative record. Real results. Killian Timney is a conservative leader with a proven track record. He's pro-life and pro-gun conservative, committing to defending our values and standing up for us. It's interesting, of course, he'd claim that he's pro-life, considering that uh, Thomas Jefferson, his opponent, was the one who was recommended by Kentucky Right to Life. Uh, Killian Timney was not because, well, during regular session this year, he put out... Uh, a a bill he sponsored a bill that was anything but pro-life that would allow abortion in more situations and for longer and so that was and i covered that uh bill on the show so that kind of eliminated him from doing that but he's still going to claim he's pro-life but that's not the worst part here it goes uh he then gives a list of his conservative record and it says things like Uh, lowered the state income tax to fight Biden's inflation, voted to keep illegal immigrants from voting in our elections, protected the private information of legal gun owners from government viewing. And keep in mind, these things that I'm talking about, these are things that uh, uh, that are so non-controversial, but he's listing his great conservative accomplishments that Bashir didn't even veto the bills he's referencing uh, in those lists. But one of the things he lists out here as a reason to vote for him is he says he removed pornography like genderqueer from schools and libraries. That's a pretty bold claim by Killian Timoney to say. And it's strange because if we rewind to 2023, he actually voted no on an amendment by Josh Calloway that would have eliminated pornography and pornographic books like genderqueer from school libraries. So how can Killian Timney claim that he somehow eliminated it? He voted against that amendment. And then on top of that, the claim that he removed pornography like genderqueer from schools and libraries is odd because right now, if you go to 
many a libraries across the state, including JCPS, Jefferson County Public School Libraries, and many schools right now, you'll find the books like All Boys Aren't Blue and Gender Queer that, that have illustrations and written descriptions of fetish sexual acts, gay pornography, and lists of porn websites. That's still in our school libraries right now. So how did he remove those things if they're still in the libraries? And how does he claim he removed them when he voted no on amendment in 2023 that would have done that? That's a good question. So somebody on Facebook posted that uh, uh, a mailer, called him out for it, showed his voting record, and Killian and Timney chimed in and he defended the mailer saying that he wasn't lying because he says... I voted for and spoke in favor of creating a process that allowed parents to challenge titles of books in their schools. And that's it. He just says, I voted for and spoke in favor of creating a process that allowed parents to challenge titles of books in their schools. That's what he says his reasoning is, that he can say he eliminated books like genderqueer from schools and libraries. Which is very fascinating. So he even admits that when it comes to actually eliminating them, he didn't eliminate them. All he did was support a process for parents to challenge the books. So I guess Timney said, hey, you know, I don't actually mind schools having pornography in them. It's okay as long as the parents can challenge it, because he voted no against an amendment that would have removed them just completely. So he doesn't mind it, as long as parents can challenge it. I mean, the challenges don't have to be successful, as very clear that the fact that the books are still there, and even following the process, the books still exist, and parents have still put put those in place. So even despite... All of that, he claims, no, no, I eliminated them. I swear I did. That doesn't make, that doesn't line up at all with the record and even his own statements. And this is what I'm talking about when all the time I say it's so important for us to stay informed because people will muddy the waters. And this is at best a misinterpretation, but at worst, based upon Killian's own words, it's pretty clear he's just outright lying. He sent out a couple of thousand mailers that are pretty much lying about his voting record and his defense as well. Yeah, I said I removed them, but I guess I really just voted for a process and, you know, parents could potentially remove them. I mean, schools can still keep them even in that process, but, you know, I put in a place a process. So I did something. And what's sad is, is that people will buy it. And it's, clear and it's used to create confusion because when his opponent runs an attack on it people will say oh what do i believe and this once again points to why we are right and people like killing timney are wrong because he feels a need to be untruthful surrounding the kinds of issues that i passionately cover every day on this program Now, when rubber meets the road, he won't actually do anything, but he'll message on it because it's what he knows we believe to be important. And of course, his defense will be, well, I didn't vote for the 2023 because it just eliminated them. And, and, you know, I believe in local control. So parents should have a process to remove the books. And what he's saying is, is he doesn't care if there's pornography being exposed to middle school or high school kids as long as locally they decided that it was cool. I don't care if it's the parent, the federal government, the the state government. Nobody should be okaying for children to see this kind of pornographic material. And it should be immediately eliminated from our schools, period. But yet, as long as there's a process, I can muddy the waters here and convince you I'm more conservative than I am. And as, as a note to people like Timony, it, it should be pretty good indication 
You're not Republican when you have to lie and twist and jump through hoops to somehow justify having the worst conservative voting record of any Republican in the Kentucky House right now. I mean, you you sign a statement saying you will support Republican principles and the platform when you run. You say that you will follow those. But yet when, when you find yourself having to squirm and worm and try to justify every single one of your voting records, every single one of your votes, because they're awful, well, maybe you're not actually Republican and that's okay. You can be not a Republican and try to be in politics, but don't pretend to be something you're not. It just doesn't make sense. Well, coming up here after this break, we've got an Airbnb story coming out of Lexington, Kentucky that went viral here recently. I'll go over a news report on this and go through just how dumb it is that this had caught on and become such a viral story as a pretty mundane thing happens. But isn't that how a lot of viral things go this this time? It's things that happen to all of us all the time, but somehow... It just catches the right note, the right time, goes viral. People share it like crazy. So we'll be going over just what happened in regards to this Airbnb story in Lexington, Kentucky, a few days ago and how the news have covered it and the story has gone viral. After this short break, you listen to the Andrew Kubrater Show, your source for Kentucky politics. Want to reach out to the show? Feel free to email info at theandrewshow.com. We'll be back here shortly. And you're back in the final segment here of the Andrew Kubrater Show. So recently, we've seen uh, an Airbnb story out of Lexington, Kentucky go viral. Maybe you've seen, heard about this. Maybe you haven't. We've got many of of local news giving two, three-minute stories about this on every single local station and even some not so local but across Kentucky. This story about something that happened in Airbnb in Lexington was their top story, top story of the day, today's top story. And with that in mind, you would think that something just awful must have happened. That that clearly somebody was in an Airbnb and it must have, I don't know, burnt down. It was infested with bed bugs, maybe. Uh, they were uh, held at gunpoint by vicious robbers. Uh, that maybe they were harassed in some sort of way by individuals. That, that there was a community of people wielding torches and pitchforks that ran them out of town. You would think that would be the case with how they covered it, but let's take a listen to what ABC 36 had to say about this Airbnb viral story, their top story of that day. Let's take a listen. Well, it was an experience a woman named Laura will never forget. She says while visiting Lexington recently with her daughter and her friends, she noticed several red flags. And after sharing her experience with police, She was shocked to learn it may have been an instance of attempted human trafficking. ABC 36's Anna Medina spoke with Laura, and for fear of possible repercussions, her her identity will will not be revealed. This was the first time that I had stayed at an Airbnb home. It's a trip that Laura will never forget, one that still leaves a lasting impact. Laura says she recently visited Lexington from her hometown of Tampa. She stayed at an Airbnb in Masterson Station. From the very beginning, she says things seemed a bit off. When I pulled up to the the home, the front door was wide open. Um, There was a, a clear storm door, like a glass storm door that was closed, but the front door was open. And um, I kind of thought, is this the right house? As her stay went on, she continued to notice more red flags. The garage door also didn't have a lock, which I thought was a little odd. Uh, we, we went out the next day and returned to find that the U-bolt, the safety latch, had been opened and the deadbolt was now unlocked. And kind of just had this feeling like somebody had been in the home. Later that night, things took an unsettling turn. While Laura and the girls getting ready for bed, one of them noticed the bedroom window was open. Laura said she made sure all of the windows were locked earlier that day. We had noticed that there was a car parked across the street earlier, um, a dark car with tinted windows. And 
once we opened that window fully, just check and see if there was a screen there. Um, I kind of, you know, put my hand out and I was like, yeah, there's no screen there, mom. And, um, the car took off. Um, uh, we, my mom called 911 right away. When police arrived, Laura says they told her to trust her instinct. She decided to take the girls and leave. I feel like somebody was here to take the girls. I said, I, I feel like we could have woken up to something very different tomorrow morning. And he said, trust your gut. He said, I can't say for certain that that's what was happening. Laura felt compelled to share her experience on social media. So... A few things here, and look, I understand that thinking you lock doors and then finding them unlocked can be a scary thing. Um, You know, it's happened to me, but come on, let's, let's go through this. Okay, so she arrives at the home. She says she found the front door open. Now, she found the front door open, but then the glass door shut, and clearly that glass door was locked. How do I know it was locked? Because they would have mentioned that the door was unlocked. So she shows up at an Airbnb and the person has locked, uh, left the front door open, but locked the glass door right before their arrival. Now, clearly somebody was just at that home earlier that day, probably just shortly before they arrived, doing the cleaning for the turn. They know you're coming to stay. They maybe check through everything, make sure it was clean. Maybe they decide they wanted to leave the door open and, and, and lights on even so you knew which home it was, you felt comfortable showing up and you weren't showing up into a dark home. Maybe that's what they were doing. I don't know. But it's not like the door was unlocked. We know that. She didn't mention it. And then she says that she checked all the windows but then found one unlocked. Not open, mind you. Because remember in the story, she said she had to opened the window and put her hand through to see if it had a screen. So to sum it up, we got a last locked glass door, front door when you arrive, window unlocked somewhere in the house, missing a screen. They say the garage door seeming to have been unlocked when you swear you locked it, and then you stuck your hand out a window and waved at a car as it drives off. Maybe, I can't, I can't imagine what a car would be doing parked on a residential street and Maybe they thought to themselves, why is this person waving at me outside of a window? They seem crazy. I'm going to drive away before they attack me. But you have all that coming together and it equals to this woman, Laura. Well, I should just go ahead and call the police. Call the police. Why? I don't know why you would call the police. What are they going to do? Show up and be like, you're right. That car drove off on a street. It was parked on the street and it drove off. The nerve of that car breaking the law this way. What's that? You swear you locked a door and it wasn't locked? We better fingerprint. I mean, to even have that reaction, to even, it wouldn't even cross my mind in that situation that I would need to call the police. But not only did she call the police, she then called the police and then went to social media talking about how she was worried about her and her girls being sex trafficked that was a claim she made in the video she was she was going to be sex trafficked now first and and many of you may know there are times where i that you you many of you have probably been through the same thing but there's many times where i've swear i've locked something and i didn't lock it you know sometimes i'm so got so much going on that i will come out of my office and stare at the lock to my office with my keys in the hand, and I'll actually hit the lock button on my car remote because I've forgotten that that doesn't lock my office door because I got so much going on. I'll be like, oh, I got to lock that. I mean, the other day I came home and I forgot to arm my alarm. You know, these things happen. And you know what I don't do? I don't call the police and assume something's afoot. What are they going to do about it? And I certainly wouldn't assume if someone is trying to break into my house that the first thing they're going to do is kidnap humans in my home for sex trafficking. Like, I get it. It's a th- I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm not saying nobody's ever broken into home to, to kidnap somebody. That happens. But broken into home to sex traffic somebody? Like, don't get me wrong. Sex trafficking's a thing, and it happens with foreign kids and women all the time here in America. 
But do you know how often an actual American citizen is kidnapped and then human trafficked? Maybe they're kidnapped, but human trafficked? Because kids and adults, as I said, they get kidnapped and horrible things happen to them. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. But are, are, are they human trafficked very often? Why doesn't that happen? Because people know you exist. The reason why foreign-born women and, and girls and, and young boys get sex trafficked, especially with our border being as open as it is, and these are awful things, is because their family sent them to America. They arrive at America and nobody knows they're here. Nobody's looking for them. So you can get away with doing that. But an American citizen with a family goes missing, people are going to be looking for them. And Airbnb, the one you're staying in, will be the first place they looked. And I'm just saying, if people if people are out there trying to traffic humans, there's an easier source than a tourist from Tampa staying in Lexington, Kentucky. Now, could have the people have been setting up to rob you? I guess that's possible. But what does this woman jump to on Facebook, on social media? What does she call the police and say? I feel like I'm going to be sex trafficked. And then on top of that, when it comes to the story, they talk about hiding her identity due to the fear of repercussions. Repercussions from whom? The homeowner? They know who you are. One of the channels even filmed outside of the home. Airbnb, they know who you are. They know the address it happened at. Like I said, the news filmed outside of the home. So who are you worried about repercussions from? The would-be kidnappers? They're like, well, you know, we weren't going to kidnap you, but now you've offended us by posting viral videos and going to the media. Now we're definitely going to kidnap you. It's ridiculous. And we cook up these stories. Look, there's enough going on in the real world to be really worried about. The fact you forgot if you locked a window or not doesn't involve you calling the police. If you feel uncomfortable, go to a hotel room, I guess. That's maybe why you shouldn't stay in an Airbnbs. But to immediately jump to, we're going to be human trafficked. I mean, come on. Stop! Get off! Get off social media. Anyways, that's all we have today for the Andrew Cooperator Show. You all have a great rest of the day, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.